morning morning family how are you doing feels like it's a long time since we've been together but we've come off a powerful ALS amen what a blessing it's been to us won't you just greet someone as you come in just welcome someone into the house of the Lord as we prepare to sing our praises and bless his name and receive from father this morning
Father, how great and how awesome it is to know that we serve an everlasting King, an almighty King, a King that stands above all kings. Glory and honor is yours, Father. Thank you for your love and your goodness and your mercy. All honor be to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. We're a bit uh, thin on the ground this morning, but just greet the people around you. Wouldn't that be nice? Well, we are welcome to the house of our King, our Father, and it's great to be here. Um, just want to um, say a few things with regards to the scriptures that we're going to be reading. I've got three short scriptures that I would like us to just get into. The first one is Matthew 3 verse 17. And it reads, and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And the question that I've, that I've asked you is, are we not also sons? Have we not also been baptized into the family of God? And the next portion of scripture is 1 John 4:17. To verse 19, it reads as follows. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so we are in the world. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not, made perfect, has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. And then Hebrews 4, verses 1. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us all, as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he has said. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Now if we just have a look, a quick look at these three scriptures. Jesus comes out of the waters of Jordan and we hear this voice, or he hears this voice that says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And that pertains to us. And then we read in John, and specifically, because as he is, so are we in this world. And then the last portion the highlight there, for indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith. Are we able today to say to ourselves and, and take on board and believe that we are truly sons of God? And that our heavenly father is well pleased with us. You see, we can only take that once we mix it with a bit of faith. And we can't stand here this morning and say that we do not have faith because each and every one of us, a yeah, who, who belongs to the kingdom of God, have had to use a measure of faith in order to be able to stand here and to proclaim that. Faith does grow, however. And possibly we need to get to that. But then in John we read, because as he is, so are we. Isn't it great to know that whatever it is that 
is available to us as being heirs to the kingdom is available to us right now because of the fact that our Heavenly Father is well pleased with us. We do not have to shrink back. We do not have to stand back and believe that we are not worthy, that we are not good enough. That is why Jesus came and he died on the cross for us. Let us pray. Father, what a privilege it is to know that we can be part of your family. Even though we are each members of our earthly families, it is such a great privilege to know that we are as sons around your table because you are our father. You have adopted us. You have taken us in as your sons and that we may live our lives victoriously. Help us, Lord, to take this understanding and knowing that as he was, so are we and that we may walk victoriously in this life being a fine example of who you are not shrinking back but standing up boldly and proclaiming you as our destiny we thank you for this father in jesus name amen
the name but the name of Jesus in the name of Father Abba Father is our Father what do you say that say he's our Father and when you trust in your Father there's absolutely nothing that can taint that nothing that can cause you to fear when you look into your father's eyes and say thank you daddy thank you father thank you Abba because you hold me you protect me you sustain me you give me life Let's sing out of that position where we look into our Father's eyes and to His Word and say, Thank you, Lord, for all that you've made me, all that you've given me, all that I am in you under the new covenant where I'm not seen by the things I do, but I'm seen by who you are and who your Son is. Oh, what a place we're in, family. What a privilege we're in. Blessed assurance Jesus is mine He's been my fourth man in the fire Time after time Born of His Spirit Washed in His blood and what he did for me on Calvary is more than enough. So I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. 
my story This is my song I'm praising my risen King and Savior all the day long I trust in God my Savior
doesn't matter where you're there for me. Doesn't matter what I do, your love's for me. You wipe away. By the mercy of your grace, sing that out. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter where I go. You walk with me when I fall. It doesn't matter where I fall. You cover me. You wipe away the tears. Leave me where I fall. My life is safe. We bless your name, Father. You're an amazing Father. Help us to comprehend your love today for each one of us. 
amazing love, incredible love. Love that is towards each one of us. Immeasurable love. We cannot comprehend the extent of that love, its height, its depth, its width, its breadth. It's just amazing. And we thank you for demonstrating that love for us in giving us not only your son, but, but in your son giving us sonship. Thank you that we could cite the scripture that says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And we know, Father, that you gave it so that we could, in Christ, be called sons of God. Help us to behave like sons. Help us to believe like sons. Help us to put our confidence in you like sons should. Some trust in horses, some in chariots, some in their own abilities. But we will forever remember you as our Father. Our trust is in you. Our hope is in you. We are learning how to dwell in this everlasting love of a God who does not judge and condemn us, but who is endearing and embracing and who includes us in everything he does. So open our eyes today to comprehend you. Open our understanding to be established in you. Give us the view, the heavenly view, that we will understand that everything you created was for your son, so that we could be called heirs of the father, joint heirs with the son. Today, Father, I pray that that kind of a faith and confidence will grip the hearts of each one of us here. That even in our darkest moments, most difficult times, when we are tested and afflicted, we will never forget that you are with us, never to leave us nor forsake us, and that you will always be there to preserve and protect us you are everything to us Lord many of your people today are faced with difficult challenges they are being tried some are tormented by illnesses and other challenges but father I pray that they will start to grow in confidence that you are there for them and that while they may go through the purifier's fire, and they may go through trials and testings, they will always remember that out of it, goodness will come. Out of it, your purpose will be established, and the miraculous will eventually show its face. You will make a way where there is no way, because you are the God of the way. And today, Lord, I pray that in this house, your people will start to arise now and rest in the knowledge of who you are. I bless this house. I pray, oh God, that, that the weak will find strength, not just in their physical beings, but in their inward spiritual man. That the dunamis of God will strengthen your people here. And that, and that every provision they need will be brought to them. Because you are the God that taught us not to be anxious for anything, but that if we seek first your kingdom and all his righteousness, things will be added to us. So take care of your people here, Lord. May they be encouraged to know that you have not forgotten your promises concerning each one of us. We give you glory today. We give you honor. 
We give you praise. We bless your name. And in the assembly of the family, we will talk of the praises of God. And we will announce that you're a good, good, good God. An amazing Father to all of us. We glorify you yet today. Come give him praise. Give him glory. Give him honor. He is worthy. He is absolutely worthy. Amen. 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 What a warm presence in the coldness. What a nice presence of God that is here. It's energizing. It's, it's, it's refreshing. It's extremely refreshing. I can just feel the Spirit of God charging spirits here. Why don't you greet each other with a family? Um, we've not just come for hype. We've come for fellowship. So greet each other, say hi to each other, and take your seats. Thank you, guys. What a great joy to welcome you, receive you uh, in our fellowship this Sunday morning, with the Lord's Day, the first day, where we could just celebrate the amazing goodness of God in our midst. There's nothing like, I was saying this to the pastors in our meeting today, no matter you know, how much you get connected to technology and, and online gatherings. There's nothing like coming together in person and experiencing the composite grace and anointing of God. That's where the Bible says in Hebrews that we must not neglect the fellowship uh, of the saints, meaning that we should come together to enjoy corporate times of divine engagement. I don't know about you, but I've been on the run. I mean, not on the run, but you know, running. Um, I don't know for how long now. And um, there's so much happening in my little world. But I just long for that Sunday morning to come here and just to fellowship with each one of you. Do you feel the same? Not to fellowship with me, but with each other. Do you feel the same? Amen, you should. And I hope more of our people that are watching online will make every effort to come together in corporate gatherings where we could enjoy His presence. Amen. Amen. Let's get to the message for today. The message for today. Uh, we're doing the series at session number five on embracing and establishing the spirit of, of Father. The spirit of Father. And I want to bring some, some insights from the Bible concerning how important it is to have a Christ-centered view of life. Say to your neighbor, Christ-centered view of life. According to the Gospel of John and the epistles of this great apostle John, and this apostle learned how to place his head on the bosom of Jesus Christ. He was often referred to as the beloved apostle. And even though Peter was the first amongst 12, this apostle was renowned for being the one that seemed to get to know the heartbeat of Jesus. And at times, when the other apostles wanted to extract information from Jesus, they would say to John, you ask him. Uh, so close was this disciple that the mother of this John and his brother, um, James, sons of Zebedee, the mother, th thought she could ask Jesus to give these two boys a very special place um, in his kingdom. And um, she wanted them to sit on his right and left hand. And Jesus said it was not in his capacity to make such an appointment, but only the Father in heaven could determine that. Um, and obviously there's various interpretations to that. But God helped him to see what it means to be, uh, be Christ-centered and Christocentric. Uh, a, a Christocentric uh, approach simply meant for John, who exposes that to us, 
it simply meant that to be in Christ is to know the Father and the Son, to fellowship with the Father and the Son. In other words, a Christ-centered approach is to study the life of Jesus as to how he related with God the Father and how God the Father related to Jesus as the Son. And by studying that, we would model our lives on the axis of that relationship. Our whole lives will be based on that relationship where God will be our Father and we will be His sons, both male and female. That's a Christ-centric view. So when we say that you are in Christ, we are saying you are living in a family where God is your Father and you view yourself as He views you, as His child, as if He only had one child. Are you understanding? But to know that, we have to not only study who we are by studying Jesus, but we have to also study who his father is by studying how he related to his father. And when we understand that, that kind of dynamic relationship, then we come to realize uh, the basis upon which all of life exists. That all of life is a life where God created everything for his child. Uh, you know, one of the fundamentals of parenthood is that, that when you do get married and have a family, your whole focus is no more on your career, but everything is focused on how I, can I create a world for my children? How can I leave them with sufficient resources that they will be sustained through life? And how can they perpetuate that culture? That's the fundamentals of, of raising a family, to live in, in biblical parlance. It's called leaving an inheritance for your children's children. Now, our father, who has foreknowledge, who is omniscient, who is omnipresent, who is, is, uh, who is omnipotent, all-powerful, he, in his foreknowledge, created everything for his son. And, and his son knows how to serve him uh, because he is, is the one that the son wants to love and represent accurately. So similarly, when we talk about the series, if you don't know God as your father, you will misplace him uh, within the, uh, you know, the, the, the whole matrix of definitions concerning um, our understanding of God. And you can, you can then you know, misplace him as creator, misplace him as judge, misplace him as a consuming fire. You could see him as one who meets your needs, your provider. You could see him as your healer or your deliverer or your protector, and in this nomenclature of definitions that describes God, you could lose out on the centrality of who God is, and that is, he is your papa, your daddy. And that's the only name that he wants you to know him by. When I get to the definition of the word father in the series, you will find that everything that you need is absorbed and expressed through the name Father, everything. You don't have to worry about you know, the, the whole list of names that he can be described. You know, if, for example, if I'm a father, but I'm also skilled as a mechanic to fix cars, you can call me a mechanic and forget I'm a father. Okay, I could be you know, a good sports person even though I can still fix cars, and you could think of me as a soccer player, or a cricket player, or a rugby player, or wherever, and miss the point that he's father first. So what I'm trying to do here is bring us back to the centrality of establishing and embracing the spirit of father. And then when you see that, you will find that his signature is on everything that he created, everything. That's what 
Romans chapter 1 says, his signature. But what happens to people who miss the point? They see his signature in a tree and they start to worship the tree. They see his signature in a rock and they worship the rock. Or they see his signature in various things and then they create various modes or images of him which he hates. He hates. He doesn't want, he doesn't want us to craft an image or an idol of him. He wants us to, to know him intimately uh, as a f- child would know a father, um, as a father would know a child. And, and those are the exciting things about this, this way of worshiping the Lord is that we, that, that we come to know God as our Father, and when you get to know that, you will realize that He, in return, He has made His Son, that's the, the Church of Jesus Christ, the corporate Son, He's made His, the, his Son the apple of His eye. Uh, that's when you start to redefine things like election and, and predestination, that, that because he had foreknowledge, before he created the heavens and the earth, he chose his son to be heir of all things. And he placed his son in a very unique position where that son will rule over all things. And that without the son, the father will not be known. And that's why the son, according to John chapter 1, would have to lead the father out of his bosom. And that, and that metaphorically is basically saying that the son makes the father visible. That in the son, you see the invisible God. And that without the son, the father cannot be known. So when portions of scripture come to you like Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the father but by me. It basically means that you can only know the Father if you function as a son. And we function in the son, that in the template, we are squeezed into the shape of divine sonship. And these are the points that I'm trying to bring in the sessions that I've done with you so far. But the whole of creation has to come back to the place now where the focus is on God the Father And when you focus on God the Father, you can only understand Him from the vantage point of of being a son of God. That's why when I make statements like I've made repeatedly uh, over the years in this church that God never called us to be Christians. There's not one scripture that says God called you to be Christians. Yes, there are scriptures that tell us that people in Antioch, Syria, uh, described the, some believers that were following Jesus as Christians. And there may be other portions of scripture uh, of Christ-like believers being called Christians, but God never called us that. Why? Why? Because he wasn't trying to create a human, a Christian race or a Christian religion. God was trying to create a new human race called Son. Are you understanding me? And that's why he's your calling and election in God is to be a son of God. That's it. And in this house, we are not trying to convert people to Christianity. We are trying to restore the image and likeness of God in each one of us. We are trying to bring us back to the way God designed us to function because there's no other purpose you have but to be a representation of God uh, true how you live your life on the earth. And so we must become the most exact examples, the most splendid examples of what it means to be serving God. When you come to realize your sonship, you come to realize that everything God created for you or everything God created in creation was for you. It's, it's too big a thought, especially when you're hustling. You know, when you're going through tough times. I have to use some crude language here. Especially when you've been challenged. And, and it seems like this idea that everything was created for me doesn't seem to work. Even the bank manager doesn't want to recognize me. You know, or 
to respond to my application for a loan or whatever. But you have to start coming to this place of, of, of what I call this restful place. This is entering into your rest. This is not laboring in a, in a kind of, a, you know, in, in, in a tedious way, where you have to make things happen. But you come to this place where you realize that when Jesus sealed uh, the covenant, the agreement, it was an agreement that brought all of us, the sons of God, into a place of abundance, of divine privilege, of provision, of sustenance, and that all of creation will eventually redirect its focus to the Son, because the Son carries the name of his Father on his forehead. That's what we have to do. And, and, um, and, and when that happens, then everything you have is anointed with the grace and presence of your divine Father. Now, we, we all have to come to the place of realizing that God has placed uh, his son over the whole of creation. Say to your neighbor, God has placed you over creation. And you live in Christ. You live in, G in Christ. The template, the model, the pattern is Jesus Christ. That's why when I read for you a few weeks ago, you must kiss the son. Uh, you know, I don't mean it in a sexual way, but the whole concept there is embrace him, embrace him, uh, adopt him, uh, bring him into your life, start thinking like a son. And believe me, what I'm telling you here today uh, are things that are foreign to the Christian world. The Christian world works in the, from this perspective of Sweat, blood, and tears. You have to pay for everything. You have to make a plan. Uh, you know, it's called works. We have to try every trick in the book to be successful. And here God is telling us, you don't have to do that. Yes, you have to maybe, you have to learn how to behave in a certain way. And your behavior could be called works. But it's not works by sheer human ability. It is that you are trusting him and when he tells you to do certain things. Um, and, and that's why when we read Hebrews, uh, that what is man that you're mindful of him or your mind is full of thoughts towards him. You know, or your, your thoughts are only towards man. It, I mean, just think about it. Think about it. God's thoughts is not about towards the animal kingdom. His, his thoughts are not towards anything. In fact, after he created everything, he went into rest. The only thought he has is towards his son who will manage all things. Okay. And God is so confident that everything he created, if it's managed by his son, will be in good hands. That's why in that context, we see that, that the Bible says, what is man that you're mindful of him, that uh, a son of man that you care for him. And care here is not care like meeting all our needs. That, that's obviously included. Care here means that you love him so much that you've endowed him with everything he needs to, to live a complete life. This is what we call the love of God, the covenant of love that God has given to us. And I'm trying to encourage us as a people here to come to this place where we don't look at our humanity and, our, um, and, and, and the sufferings that we go through uh, from that vantage point, but we look at everything through the, spec through the lens that tells us that God is my Father and his thoughts are towards me, he's mindful of me, and he will take absolute good care of me. He's made every provision available for me to live a complete life on the earth. Do you think you can come to that place? Now, now it's also of fundamental importance that you understand that you cannot exist without your father. 
You cannot exist without knowing God as your Father. In fact, the Bible says that unless we come to understand our, our God as our Father, we will not live. That's what the Bible says in Hebrews. We will not live. In other words, we will not live a fulfilled life. We will not exist the way God wants us to exist. So it is in that context we must read portions of scripture like the story of the prodigal son. Because the story of the prodigal son is a story of, a, uh, of the human race represented in the son who wanted independence and his own uh, and, 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 and the resources to create his own legacy. And uh, and the conclusion of the story in, in Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 50, uh, 32, is that God, if you went to God today like Adam did in the garden, and said, I don't want to be like you. Because the devil said, you know, if you eat of this tree, of the fruit of this tree, you will be like God. What Adam should have said was that God has already created me in his image and likeness. But, but what Adam was saying was, I don't want to be in his image and likeness. I want to create my own likeness of how I perceive myself to be before God. He created what we call the independent view that separated him from God. And what happened to Adam the moment he separated? And remember, in a singular man, Adam is plural man. Because the word Adam is a play with words. It refers not just to one person, but all the persons in that one person. It refers to the whole of the human race, Adam, Adama. And um, so all of man was in Adam, like in this prodigal son. And so he tells his father, he says, I want to go and create my own life. But what happens to him when he goes to create his own life? He sins against heaven. What does that mean? Heaven is our throne. That simply means that the way God designed man to function is now violated. The word sin here doesn't have a moral or an ethical connotation to it. It has a, it, it has a design to it. The, word, the whole concept of sin is the concept of how God designed us to function. So when you sin against heaven, you are sinning against the executive seat for the governance of the human race. And the executive seat simply means that heaven designed you to function effectively on the earth. Heaven is the throne, earth is the footstool. But you choose a different way that violates the design of heaven. Um, and God puts his constitution in the heavens to be expedited on the earth. And, we, and, and this young man, in Luke chapter 15, he says, I don't want to live by heaven's design, I want to become the architect of my own world. Are you understanding? So he, he says, I've sinned against heaven and against you. So the heavenly design was, you have to always stay connected to God as your father. That's the design. You can't be connected to your salary or the things that gives you a false sense of security. A degree could be a false sense of security. Uh, your little world could be a false sense of security. Or the, or the things that you think define you could be a false sense of security. Your security is in knowing God as your father. If you don't do that, you're a sinner. And you could tell me, but I don't smoke, I don't drink, um, I don't do all the stuff that religion tells you, um, you know, not to do. And um, you could say that, but I'm, I, I'm good. I'm good. But the reality is there's no one good unless one steps into the design again. Are you getting me here today? So remaining connected to your, to your heavenly father, and obviously God will also put an earthly spiritual father in your life, 
which is a domestic side to a heavenly uh, aspect. That's why whenever Elijah or Elisha or when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, cries out, um, it will cry out, Abba, Father, my Father, my Father, which simply means that you have to, be, you have to learn how to be positioned in a heavenly context and on an earthly co uh, context correctly so that you could ensure the blessings of God. So violation, and this is so important, that while the Father places you over creation, your placement over creation is directly connected to your relationship with God as your Father. If you don't get that connection, you will not function effectively. Are you hearing me here today? Please, this is so, so important for us. Um, and if you are disconnected from that connection called Father, then you are not worthy to be called the Son of God. So we can't be theoretical here and say, oh, I'm God's Son, but live your life independent of that connection. Yeah. We all must learn that being worthy to be called a son. Remember what God did, and Pastor Henry read a portion of scripture. Uh, when Jesus came to the river, Jordan, to be baptized, and I heard something so interesting from, from Dr. Hiles uh, this weekend, that the place that Jesus came to get baptized was the same place the whole nation of Israel crossed from the wilderness into the promised land. Same place, same place. And, um, and, and the point is that at that river Jordan, the heavens opened over Jesus and the voice said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. When, when you get the pleasure of your father, he's saying you're worthy. He's saying you're credible. You're authentic, you're genuine, you are the real deal. That's what is being said here. But how do you get that worthiness? You have to function like a son. And that functionality is determined on making sure that you know God as your father and you are known as his son. If you violate that principle, it's called antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son is anti-Christ. That's what the Bible says. You can read that in, in the epistles of John, uh, First and Second John specifically. You're an anti-Christ. I know we've polit politicized anti-Christ. We say that he's some political figure that will come up in the last days. No, when you reject the Father and you reject your sonship, in the family of God, you are anti-Christ. Um, this is not being a false Christ. There's a this difference between false Christ. Those are impersonators of Christ. So you can choose, am I an impersonator of a Christ without knowing God as my father? Or am I anti-Christ where I reject God as my father? Uh, and there's very little hope for us because in the, when the separation takes place, those categories of people will be removed. But we that are going to start to see the blessings of God in this season must come to a place of understanding how important it is to, to view yourself uh, from that vantage point. You know, the Father makes some powerful statements uh, that helps us to understand the principle of connectedness. The Father makes statements like, like your brother was dead, was lost, uh, was dead and he's alive again. He was dead and he's alive again. I mean, you think about that. When you're not connected to the Father, you don't have life in you. But when you're connected to the Father, you live. You will have everlasting life, eternal life, uninterrupted life, endless life. That's what it means. In other words, you've already, then you would have burst the bubble of chronology and of mortality, and of death. And we've now come into a dimension of living in this eternal position that whether I live in this body 
or do not live in this body, I will always live. Are you understanding that? Uh, and that life is no more def are defined by the number of my days on the earth, but it's defined by my connectivity to my Father. And that Father puts His Spirit in you. And that Spirit, which is called the Holy Spirit, gives you endless life. Okay? The, in other words, the breath that God put into a, a Adam when he was being, after he was formed is the same breath that comes in you, the ruach that comes in you, the rhema, I mean the, uh, the, uh, the spirit that comes into you. And when that spirit comes into you, you will live and not die anymore. So, I mean, when you get the father-son dynamic right, all the doctrinal positions we were taught in life suddenly dovetail. They come to that consummate position where everything can be seen as a complete unit. We don't have to anymore you know, dissect and, uh, and compartmentalize uh, these various doctrines and hope that we, we tick all the blocks because everything just comes together in one man. And it's all got to do with this idea of living. And later on, the father says in the same breath, he says, he was not only dead and is now alive, but he was lost. So when you're not connected to the Father, what are you? Lost. You could have a business plan. You could have a, you could have a vision statement. You could have your ambition statements. You could have a timeline on when you're going to become the next millionaire. Five years from now, you'll be still lost. You'll be lost. But when you know your Father in this way, you will never be lost. You would have found the place, uh, the accurate place of your location. Uh, and this is something that the church has to understand. So the other thing that you need to know, and Jesus highlighted this and I referred to it, uh, you know, is a question in, in, in John chapter 14. Let's read it. Let's read it. Are you all with me? John chapter 14, I read 4. I'm going very slow with these things because I know how important it is that we get this right. You know, the Bible says here in John 14, do not let your hearts be troubled. Uh, this is after Jesus speaks about his impending death uh, and he's alluding to uh, crucifixion in chapter 13. And, and, and the, uh, the disciples are quite distraught and not comfortable. And he says, don't worry. He's basically saying, don't adopt this depressed position, this anxious position. Don't, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Okay, and he's talking about the father-son that I had there. He says, and look at the language. My father's house has many rooms. Actually, when you go to the original Greek, it says, in my father's house, there are many places, many units. Now, I know we've, you know, the material gospel has so, has defined this text from the vantage point of uh, when I get to heaven, I'll get a mansion, okay, which is so badly interpreted. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And you know, the, the joke is that God took six periods of time uh, to create the heavens and the earth and everything in them. But Jesus has taken 2,000 years to build you a house. I mean, that doesn't make sense, am I correct? But that's how we in classical Pentecostalism was brought up to think. But basically, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back and take you to be with me that, that, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Now, that's the background to, what, what, to the question that Thomas will ask. But the, the, the background here is very simple, that I'm going to the cross. I'm going to reconcile you to my father. My father has such a big heart that he will accommodate you as a son like me, that where you, I am, you may be. 
meaning that if I'm a son within this dynamic, you automatically will become a son. Okay? That's the background uh, to it. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? So we don't know where you're going. We don't understand this way. And I understand that from a classical Judaistic position. The Jews could not comprehend um, this whole idea of sonship. The Jews could see themselves as, as a very peculiar group of people, exclusive group of people in a religious system called Judaism that gave them an unfair advantage over other nations and religions. They could understand that. But they couldn't understand intimacy based on, the, on a relationship between a father and a son. And this is what Jesus answered. He said, I am the way. Now, he's not saying I am the way as in a roadmap. But I am the way as in a position. And now, what is that position? It's exactly what was read today for us in the invocation that at, at the River Jordan, when Jesus came out of the water, a, a, a voice declared over him, this is my son, in whom I'm well pleased, and the dove descended upon him, meaning that the Holy Spirit now came to tabernacle with the Logos in a human body called Jesus Christ. And now Jesus is saying, I am the way. He's basically saying, I am son, which is the way. In other words, the way is a person. It's not a road map. It's not... It's not some directive. It's saying, if you know how to adopt me as the way, the truth, and the life, I, son, that, that's the thing that we should, we should add to the scripture. We should append it to the scripture. I, son, am the way. And then he says this, uh, no one comes to the Father except through me. Except through me. And this word through here, is, is a very powerful word, meaning the channel, the channel to the Father is Son. So if you want to get to the Father, if you want to run boldly into his presence, if you don't want to follow decorum and protocol, adopt sonship. As a son, and any parent amongst us will know that our children do not have to make an appointment with us. They have direct access to us based upon the fact they are our children. Similarly, you don't have to do anything to come to your father. You can run boldly into his presence because you are his child. Uh, and I mean, look at little children. They're so innocent. Uh, and what did Jesus speak about when he spoke about the kingdom to people like, like Nicodemus um, and, and, and to others later on? Jesus very clearly said that unless you become like a child, you will not be able to enter the kingdom. And sometimes we think that means that we have to become, we have to become childish or childlike, but that's not the point. Yes, you have to become childlike, but it's, it's highlighting a relational principle. Unless you view yourself as a child, as a son, as a daughter, you will not understand the economy of God's kingdom. In other words, you will not understand the estate that your father wants you to rule over. And all the privileges of that estate. You're not, you're not a slave. You're not a visitor. You're a child of God. And God has given his kingdom to his son, to his children. And that's the point that's being made here. And he says, I am the way. So the way to God is the way called son. And it's in that, for from now on, he says, and, and if you really know me, listen to this, you will know my father as well. Yeah, he, he now he's telling you what the way, it's a position, it's a relationship. It's, it's, it's a privilege you have. If you know me, you know my father. Yeah. If you'd known me, you will know my father as well. From now on, from now on, you do not know him and have seen him. 
you, I mean, you do know him and have seen him. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. In other words, if you can adopt the same position I adopt, then you can enjoy him. I mean, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, his disciples came to him and said, teach us to pray the way you pray. And what was so different? Because these boys cut their teeth in Judaism. And in classical Judaism, a father took his son to prayer. And the Hebrews were no different to, to the sons of Ishmael. They prayed five times a day. So these Hebrew boys could pray. They knew all the protocols of prayer. But they never knew intimacy in prayer. They never knew pr that prayer could become not a ritualistic ceremony, but prayer could now become a conversation between a father and a son. When we go into the closet, we're not talking about privacy in a sexual way, in an intimate way, in that. I mean, the connotations are there. But the whole idea of closet relationship is intimacy. But intimacy in a father-son relationship is not called intimacy. It's, it's, it's intimacy as in a relationship between two realms, between two individuals. And in this context, it's a father and son. And the disciples came to him and said, teach us how to pray like this. And he said, this is how you pray. And he, you pray by first seeing God as our father. Now remember, he's talking to the group. If he was talking to just one in the group, he would, said, he would have said, this is how you pray, my father. But because he's speaking to the 12 apostles, his disciples, he said, you pray, our father. Are you understanding? Our father, which art in heaven. That's why today when I see how people pray also, and they make such an exercise of it. It's so religious, it's so, so ceremonial. I'm not saying, you know, there's no protocols, there's no decorum, there's no respect, because, I mean, this is our Father, the creator of all things. We will show him respect. But the idea is that you can have conversations, discussions with him. You can talk about the business. You can talk about the estate. You can talk about his secrets. You can talk about what's his thoughts about how you're going to represent him in your vocation. You can talk about how, wh why? Because you know the way to him now. The way is that I have this, I have this position. And sometimes we get so caught up with, with privilege that we forget position. And position is that I have been legally established, it's called justification, as a son of God. And because I'm legally positioned, I can have this conversation. And I think all of us have to learn now how to even upgrade our praise from formality to a very dynamic relationship where there's reverence and holiness, but there's openness and transparency. Do you think you can talk to God like that? Where you can have a personal conversation and you don't have to go with the King James language and the old King James language and, um, and you have to, you know, do all the stuff. I'm not good like Dr. Hiles. He can demonstrate all that. I mean, if I learn a joke and I add it to my sermon, by the time I get to the pulpit, I forget what, I, what the joke was. <laughs> so I'm not good at all these things, but... But you know what I'm talking about. Some of, you, some of our kids here will have no clue to what I'm referring to because you just cut your teeth in this present season. But um, those of us that come from formal and classical backgrounds, uh, you know, prayer was like, like making a long speech to somebody that was in a distant country. And you had to dot your eyes and cross your T's and punctuate your sentences and you have to do it the English way, old English way. Okay, but, um, but now you can just have very, very intimate conversations with him, wherever you are. And Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Just show us the Father and that will be enough. 
And this is what he says. He says, don't you know me, Philip? Don't you know me, Philip? Being with you. you you've ate with me. You've touched me. You've watched me pray. You've watched me operate. You know, you've watched me share and talk about the intimate things. I, you've, you've walked with me all the time. Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me, who has seen the Father, who, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So how do you, the in, God cannot be seen. God is the Father of spirits. So how does, he, how does he get seen? He gets seen first in the perfect example, which is Jesus Christ, where the incarnate Logos and the eternal spirit came to dwell in him. And when the word and the spirit dwelt in him, he became the most exact, brilliant display of the heavenly Father. He made God visible. Now, how does people see God? They don't see him in trees, in idols, in images. Um, they see him in you and me. When they see how you display God, the Father, then they have seen God. That's what Jesus is saying here. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us, put on display the Father? In other words, I'm the mannequin. If you study me, you've studied the Father. Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his works. So when I say we, are, we have to develop this Father-centric view, I'm basically saying that this father is now, his seed is in me, his spirit is in me, his nature is in me, his person is in me. And when people see me, they're seeing a chip of the old block. Are you understanding? They're seeing the very essence, the nature of the father on display. Believe me when I say that I am in the father and the father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. In other words, just study all the things I've done and you will see that everything I did was not to bring attention to me. Have you ever wondered why Jesus would, say, would heal somebody and then he'll say, don't tell anyone? Don't tell anyone. What was the point? He wasn't wanting to draw attention to his humanity. He wanted to draw attention to the presence of his father in him. And he always pointed people back to God, back to God. Now similarly, I mean, I know today in the 21st century, if somebody raises somebody from the dead, he will draw attention to how he raised them from the dead. You know, we are so human-centered. Um, if we, we perform a miracle, then the whole world must know that we opened a blind eye or did something. But in the life of Jesus, he understood his mission statement. His mission statement was very simple. I'm living to display my father. My father works in me. Whatever I do must reveal my father. Are you understanding that? Whatever you do, if you drive the best vehicle, you live in a beautiful house, you, you put on the symbols of success, you clothe yourself with the best garments, whatever you do, if it's to draw attention to you, you're not on a father's business assignment. In fact, you're idolatrous. That's tough, eh? Can I have an altar call right now? <laughs> That's tough. But whatever you do, if it, was, it is to highlight the father, your mission is correct. Then the, you are complying with the heavenly assignment. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing. Do you believe in Jesus? Then do you know what works you should be doing? The works of a son. The works of a son. And, and they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. What's he saying here? Now that you study me and I'm going to be with my Father, and my father is going to be with me. 
Can you imagine how powerful you can operate? In fact, you can do bigger things because you got the two witnesses, the Father and the Son, certifying what you do because you're now operating in sonship. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. And his name in this context is not Jesus. His name in this context is the Son. That's the name in the Godhead. So if I may paraphrase this, and this is my, my understanding of the scripture, he's not saying if you ask in Jesus' name, now I'm not in any way taking away from you the idea that you must not use the name Jesus when you're praying. You can do that because demons don't like that name, especially when you use it right. But I think what he's saying here is, if you know how to operate in the Son, whatever you ask as a Son, your Father will give it to you. And I mean, you know Matthew chapter 6, um, there he speaks about uh, we being human fathers, natural fathers, know how to give good gifts to our children. If, uh, if, for, example, if for example, you ask for bread, uh, will he give you uh, a stone? If you ask for fish, will he give you a, a scorpion or a serpent? Okay. Now, if you as human fathers know how to give good gifts to your children, how much will your Father in heaven give to you if you ask correctly? Remember the language again? It's a relational language. It's familial language. It's language of a child asking dad. And the comparative is human families versus the heavenly family. That's the comparative. Now the confidence you must have is that your father knows what's best for you and he will never withhold good gifts from you if you start thinking like a son of God. I mean, I've said this before to you. Do you know that from 1994, God taught me how not to ask him for material things. I mean, I've not yet prayed for money for the buildings next year. I don't pray for, and I, I mean, my needs are huge every month. Airfares alone is hundreds of thousands of rands. And, and I, I've not, I don't ask him for airfares. I, I, I don't break through for financial, uh, for financial provisions. I've not asked him for houses and, and all the nice things that I enjoy today. All I know is that if I stand before my father and ask him for things like wisdom, counsel, knowledge, understanding, I'm asking him for deeper insights into the word. I'm asking him to give me lips that drip with grace, eyes that see you with the, through, the, through the vantage point of the seven spirits, the complete Holy Spirit. Uh, I ask him for, uh, for discernment, uh, for dissecting things spiritually. But material things I've not asked him for. Because I know there's a scripture that says that, that before you ask him, he'll take care of you. And believe me, the church has become too materialistic in its focus, too self-centered, too ostentatious. The church is too consumed with itself. You know, people love themselves more than they love God. But I'm learning that if you ask him, and remember the things he, asks, he, he uses here. I mean, bread and, and fish has got nothing to do with your, your daily food. Uh, bread and fish here is talking about deep spiritual things between the earthly and heavenly realms. Fish belongs to the oceans. And when God separated the waters, uh, from the waters, one part became earth and the other part became the ocean and another part became the heavens. And so when we talk about these dimensions, he's talking about the inner depths of spiritual engagement. Very powerful things that will start to happen in the church of Jesus Christ. And, and all of you here, yeah, as soon as you start to grow in this deep, quiet, restful, and very composed 
sense of knowing that God is your father, you're going to become so calm that even if there's a storm in your lake, you will sleep in the helm of the boat in the midst of the storm, knowing that your father carries all things. Um, are you understanding? And at times, as a son, you can still the storm simply because others are still growing in their knowledge of divine sonship. And that's what happened to Peter. So it's in that context. Let me finish this. Jesus, uh, and if you love me, keep my commandments. And listen to this. So follow my ways. Follow my instructions, my mentoring of you. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. And the advocate here means parakletos in the Greek, which means one who will come alongside you and aid or guide or instruct, or sometimes like a legal aid, like a legal advisor, give you an insight into heavenly matters. Don't think about legalism here as in to compliancy in earthly matters. It's helping us to understand the constitution of heaven, helping us to understand design and fundamental protocols concerning how God wants us to live. And so he says, okay, I understand that you're finding difficulty with some of the things I'm telling you. So I'm going to ask my father to send you the same spirit that I had. And this spirit is going to guide you, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you, and you will be, and, and will be in you. So you will know him, or you know him, because he lives in you, and he will be with you. So, so one of the first signs of the Holy Spirit coming upon you is that you must know that he is uh, your legal aid, your legal guide. But listen to what it says here. I will not leave you as orphans. Look at the language here. I will not leave you as orphans. What is, what is an orphan? Somebody who does not have a father and a mother. Somebody that is without parents. So what will the Holy Spirit come to do? He will come to help you know that you're not an orphan. You're not abandoned. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, he will help us to understand that we have direct connection or access to the Father. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I will come to you. That's why when, he read, when we read the first verses, don't be troubled. If you believe in God, believe in me. But I go to my Father. In other words, the Holy Spirit will connect you to the position of understanding, hey, you are not an orphan. God is your Father. You have a, a very unique place in his family. That place is called seated with him in heavenly places. Now do you sit in one seat, but you operate in heavenly places. How does he raise you up and gives you every blessing in heavenly places? Um, what he's saying is when the Holy Spirit comes into you, you will realize that you have an executive privilege in the family of God. It's called, it, the, the imagery is right hand. And that everything that you need to know about your father, as an executor, you will know it because the Holy Spirit will connect you. You see, the overemphasis today is that you must speak in tongues. And I believe in speaking in tongues, and I speak in it, and there are times when I don't know how to pray. I, I, there's no conversations I can have meaningfully with my father because I've run out of too many discussions. And then I pray in the Spirit, and the Holy Spirit strengthens my inner man, and then I can talk to my father again on deeper things, or he would speak and pray through me. So you can not strengthen your inner man, and you need to have the Holy Spirit in those areas. But that's not all. The Holy Spirit comes to tell you you're not an orphan, to help you to understand the mind of your father, to give you instructions concerning what you should do in your earthly responsibilities, and when you start to function like that, you enjoy the blessings of God. Yeah. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you, but you will see me. 
because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, that's sonship, and I am in you, that's the divine Son in you, you are in the Son. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. And how will he show himself to us? As we heard again from the scripture, which ties up so beautifully, as he is, so are you. And how does he function? As a son. So how will you function? As a son. And he will teach you everything you need to know about sonship. And how does he teach you? Through the Holy Spirit. That's why the Spirit comes upon you and gives you the spirit of adoption. And your spirit then cries out, Abba, Father, according to Romans chapter 8 and Galatians chapter 3. Your spirit cries out, Abba, Father. Now these are very, I mean, we've done these, some of these teachings in the past. Um, but I think it's very important for me to read the scriptures, go slowly uh, through them with us, because I need us to see that not only should have we been placed over creation, but our connection to the Father of that placement is critical for us to enjoy the blessings that will make us rich and add no sorrow to our lives. Believe me when I tell you, we're coming to the time now where sons of God will start learning how to imitate their father. Yeah. And if you study all our children, they, they carry certain characteristic mannerisms that are peculiar to their parents. The principle of transferred uh, uh, behavioral patterns. And there's such an impartation that's going to come upon the church presently. I'm actually excited because I think we're going to see a manifest display of the invisible Father through our behavior and our conduct. Are you ready for that? Are you really ready for that? Come, let's stand. Let's stand. Today, I've gone very, very slowly with us, but the series, I think, is the most critical series in our existence uh, as the children of God. It's, it's so important. Bow your heads in prayer. Now, the, your humanity, as in your earthly position, will contradict everything that I'm trying to say to us. Our humanity will tell you that these things are far-fetched, surreal, and beyond, beyond our comprehension. But you would have to keep praying, and this is the prayer, that you will ask your Father to teach you His ways. And you would ask the Holy Spirit to teach you how to be everything your Father wants you to be. Um, and then these are so important things. If you can come to a place of rest in these areas, I think you would enter into the greatest breakthroughs of your lives. I can't overemphasize it. I can't overemphasize it. How God will come through for us in so many ways in our lives. So just bow your heads, raise your hands to the Lord, ask Him to help you in these areas. The days of striving are over. You can never succeed in this horrible world we live in. It's impossible to trade, to function, if you carry the identity of survival. But if you carry the identity that God is my Father, you will succeed. Pray for yourselves. This is true salvation. The Bible says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. This is not dealing with your sins. It's dealing with your disconnectivity, your wanderings, your sense of connection to Him. That's what it means. Work out your salvation. And as you work out your sonship, everything else will, will readjust itself. So Father, help us today. 
Open our eyes to understand these things, our hearts to receive them, our spirits to make some adjustments. Help us to come to a place of learning how to operate in the sun, but function as sons in the earth. Help us to realize that the covenant that you made and sealed in the blood of your son was a covenant for sons to enjoy the finished provisions that you created for all of us. So Lord, we want to labor to enter into rest like you entered into your rest. And help us, Lord, to come to the place of self-revelation. We bless you today, Father. We worship you. You're an amazing God. I thank you for the calm that we feel in this place today. Now let that calm grip our spirits and our souls and fill our beings with the joy of the Holy Spirit that will strengthen us and give us the energy to walk through life knowing that we are the children of the Most High God. Oh, we bless you, Father. We bless you. Sharamanda Rabasikacha. take those emblems and um, I hope by now you know that these are not rituals but they help remind us of the covenant amazing covenant sometimes we get caught up with the blessings of this covenant but forget the position that we have in the covenant that God gave his son to demonstrate how much he loved us that we could be brought into sonship. Celebrate sonship today as you eat and drink. Would you do that? Go ahead and do it. Bless you, Father. Say to your neighbor, I'm a son of God. Say to your neighbor, God is my father. Ask your neighbor, are you at rest with that whole idea? You know, we can put all the psychiatrists and psychologists out of work 
at least at least these pastors are at work in this church if you grab that idea all the stress the anxieties and the troubles we have in our marriage is sometimes connected to mental challenges because we don't know who we are the biggest problem in the world is an identity problem go in the grace of god let his peace be with you the lord loves you let that banner be over each one of you